Hi guys, Dane here, and welcome to another episode of Archive 5, where I take five reviews and basically whack them all together. Today, we're doing the first of the uh, Penguin Mini Modern Classics episodes. So, as some of you may know, I bought the box set of all 50 of the Penguin Mini Moderns, and so I figure what I'm going to do is literally going to read through them all in order. We're going to do 10 videos with uh, five of these books in each video, and I'm going to share my thoughts on them. So, as always the timestamps will be below so you can click on them in the description it will just take you straight to the review you're interested in it's also going to be up on the, uh, the screen here or you could just watch all five reviews if you'd like to so in this video we have got books one to five in the collection so we have Martin Luther King a letter from Birmingham jail we have Allen Ginsberg a television was a baby crawling toward that death chamber we have Daphne du Maurier the Breakthrough, we have Dorothy Parker, The Custard Heart, and we have Akutagawa and others, three Japanese short stories. So as I said, the timestamps for all of those will be linked, this is just the first five of 50 in the collection, and uh, yeah, wish me luck with the remaining 45 of these. Today I am watching Steve Partridge. Nando's when it launched. By the way, I don't know if you've noticed, but the flag in the background just like waves like that these days. And it's because there's a heater beneath it and the heat rises and it lifts the flag up. Fun fact. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Martin Luther King Jr.'s Letter from Birmingham Jail. So this is book one in the Penguin Mini Modern Classics. And this is part of a series where I'm going to go through and do all of them, effectively. All, all 50 of them in this collection. So, uh, it says on the back here, This landmark missive from one of the greatest activists in history calls for direct, non-violent resistance in the fight against racism and reflects on the healing power of love. And I do think, I must say, I do think it does seem like a good one to start the, the run with, if that makes sense. I think because it is you know it's almost an an essay on you know acceptance and equally on the rights that we have as people to make our voices heard and so i think in that sense it works really well as the first book of the of the set i like on the inside we have a little quote here it says injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere and that's just part of a quote of the wider letter so i'm going to go through and uh, read a few of my highlights about this really so so we've got here some information about King. So it says, uh, written on the margins of a newspaper in an Alabama jail in 1963, Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from Birmingham jail is a response to eight white Alabama clergymen who argued that the battle against racial segregation should be fought in the courts, not the streets. The Three Dimensions of a Complete Life was first delivered as a sermon at the New Covenant Baptist Church in Chicago on April the 6th, 1967. It was later republished in A Gift of Love, a collection of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s sermons compiled largely from his book Strength to Love. And so yeah, this is both Letter from Birmingham Jail and then at the end of it, The Three Dimensions of a Complete Life. What I will say is one of the things that I found kind of entertaining is the fact that it is a letter from Birmingham Jail because I grew up near Birmingham here in the UK, which I presume is where Birmingham, Alabama is named after. I, I don't know that for a fact, but I've always just kind of assumed that. But I would say, you know, I think, I think a decent chunk of the British population know that there is a Birmingham in Alabama as well as the Birmingham in, in the Midlands. So we're doing all right there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you the start of the letter from Birmingham Jail. So it says, April 16th, 1963. My dear fellow clergyman, while confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling my present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. If I sought to answer all the criticisms that cross my desk, my secretaries would have little time for anything other than such correspondence in the course of the day, and I would have no time for constructive work. But since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and that your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I want to try to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. And I think he succeeded in that. I mean, I guess one of the reasons why this letter in particular is included here, A, it does talk a lot about again the the rights it, well it, it's it's kind it's kind of covering king's struggle but equally these people are almost trying to tell him 
that you shouldn't even be struggling. You should, you know, you sit down, Mr. Black Man, and wait for us to sort it out in the white man courts. And like, and he's like, no, I will work. <laughs> like, as you, as you quite rightly should be. But he's like, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not just gonna sit back and and take this shite. In fact, here we go. Let me read this short section. This gives you a really good overview of what exactly the problem is. So it says. Then, last September, came the opportunity to talk with leaders of Birmingham's economic community. In the course of the negotiations, certain promises were made by the merchants, for example, to remove the store's humiliating racial signs. On the basis of these promises, the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth and the leaders of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights agreed to a moratorium on all demonstrations. As the weeks and months went by, we realised that we were the victims of a broken promise. A few signs, briefly removed, returned. The others remained. As in so many past experiences, our hopes had been blasted and the shadow of deep disappointment settled upon us. We had no alternative except to prepare for direct action, whereby we would present our very bodies as a means of laying our case before the conscience of the local and the national community. Mindful of the difficulties involved, we decided to undertake a process of self-purification. We began a series of workshops on non-violence, and we repeatedly asked ourselves, are you able to accept blows without retaliating? Are you able to endure the ordeal of jail? We decided to schedule our direct action program for the Easter season, realising that except for Christmas, this is the main shopping period of the year. Knowing that a strong economic withdrawal program would be the byproduct of direct action, we felt that this would be the best time to bring pressure to bear on the merchants for the needed change. He says here, You may well ask, why direct action? Why sit-ins, marches and so forth? Isn't negotiation a better path? You are quite right in calling for negotiation. Indeed, this is the very purpose of direct action. Non-violent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so to dramatise the issue that it can no longer be ignored. And I think that's very telling of King as a person, but it's also spot on. Like, he's saying, well, we do, what we want to negotiate. We want to have calm, rational talks about this issue. The problem is, is that if you're not letting us talk or our voices can't be heard, what we have to do is we have to take to the streets, we have to protest this. And I think he's, you know, ahead of his time, really. I mean, this this was in the 60s, to be fair, so the 60s was kind of a time for, like, protest marches and stuff, but I think it's still very relevant today. And, I mean, I'm saying that as someone who has got on maybe three protest marches, something like that. And one of them I went on was an anti-protest because some racists came to protest in our town. They, they wanted to shut the mosques down, that was it, because we have a very high Muslim... Um, population here in High Wycombe. We have also, unfortunately, there have been one or two people that have been on the news because they've gone to join ISIS in Syria or, or wherever they've gone to, to join them. And and it's a shame because we have this really vibrant, you know, Muslim community in Wycombe that, if, if nothing else, even if you're a racist, you can't deny the sheer, like, the, the value to the local economy that they bring, the jobs they're creating, like, <laughs> the services they offer. I don't know. People are weird. He makes a good point here as well, because a lot of people are just saying to him, wait, wait, it'll sort itself out. And he says, perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait, but when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick and even kill your black brothers and sisters, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that fun town is closed to coloured children and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky and see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness towards white people when you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who is asking daddy why do white people treat coloured people so mean when you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you. When you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and coloured. When your first name becomes, I'm not even going to say it, the N-word. Your middle name becomes Boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John, and your wife and mother are never given the respected title Mrs. When you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro, living constantly at tip 
Naruto stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and are plagued with inner fears and outer resentments. When you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over, and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. I mean, <laughs> that was... Just even just reading that aloud, that was powerful as fuck. <laughs> like he's, he did actually say in this, he mentioned that his, uh, his father, his, I think it was his father, his grandfather, and his great grandfather had all been, you know, priests or it wasn't a priest, but you know the word, I can't, uh, pastor or whatever it was. I don't do religion, I'm afraid. But all three of them had worked as a religious figurehead, effectively, and you can see that that like public speaking and the that approach to it has been passed down to him and actually when he's when he does his speeches and when he delivers his speeches he is almost like a religious leader as opposed to a, a, just a mere protester i guess i use the word mere there but you know what i mean it's one of those books that despite the fact that he's not necessarily thought of as a writer he is a writer like <laughs> And just reading his arguments and the way he structured things here, it's just devastating. Like, it, I can see how King's side and, or, or well, I suppose the battle's still being fought, but King's side has kind of won and we're headed towards a more tolerant society. But it was inevitable when you read his words and you're like, oh my god, like, <laughs> the argument he's putting down, how can you argue against this man? You cannot do it. Now, the only thing I would say is a negative, really. We do get into the three dimensions of a complete life, which is the second bit, because this, all I've read for you, is just like the first half of Letter from Birmingham Jail. So I, I do recommend actually picking this one up. Um, I mean, I'm actually really enjoying working through the set in general, but this one in particular, I think, is a great one to pick up, just because of its historical context. And again, if you're into books anywhere near as much as I am I guess and if you're watching this video I assume you are it's just incredible just to see his grasp of language and like you know what I mean it's like when you read a master at work and and Luther King you have to take your hat off to him he did in the three dimensions of a complete life talk about God a fair amount which isn't necessarily relevant to me because I don't happen to believe in God but I think it does say, yeah, it was delivered as a sermon at the New Covenant Baptist Church. And so again, you can see that influence coming down from his father and his grandfather, etc. All in all, then, I just think this is an, it's an important book. And even though it's not originally imagined as a book, it is basically the transcripts of... Well, the first one is a letter and the second one's a transcript of a sermon. But it works really well and I just think it's fascinating. And uh, yeah, definitely worth checking this one out, even if you don't get to any of the others. And uh, rating time, I still I gave it a 4 out of 5 because it wasn't necessarily mind-blowing. I agree with everything he said kind of thing, but it's more of its importance, if that makes sense. It's a book that makes you think. It's not a book you enjoy, it's a book that makes you think. That's a good way of putting it. And on that note, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this. Hit subscribe if you're new here, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Television Was a Baby Crawling Toward That Death Chamber by Allen Ginsberg. So this is Penguin Modern Mini Classic number two. It says on the back, Profane and Prophetic Verses About Sex, Death, Revolution and America by the Great Icon of Beat Poetry. So Ginsberg, I guess, is, is not my favourite poet, but he is one of my favourites. He's probably my second or third favourite poem, I think. We have a nice little quote here at the beginning. His tongue is the prick of a devil. Yeah, basically. Oh, so it says here, all these poems are taken from collected poems, 1947 to 1997. First published in 2006. And I do actually have collected poems, but it was a nice excuse to reread some of them. So the poems included in this collection include Pull My Daisy, A Supermarket in California, America, Death to Van Gogh's Ear, Television was a baby crawling toward that death chamber. I am a victim of telephone, mind breaths, fourth floor dawn, up all night writing letters, love comes, sphincter, personals ad, American sentences, 
and come on pigs of western civilization eat more grease <laughs> I like the titles they just make me laugh I don't know why so of these poems um, a supermarket in California I believe that was in Howl and other poems as well that I think I studied that one actually a uni maybe I can't remember I'm gonna read that one to you in a minute America is one is I, I memorized that poem and there is if you check out my Shakespeare tag which I'll link to below Shakespeare book tag I uh, did the entire poem with while wearing a blindfold I was wearing a blindfold so this is that poem Look, I'll show you this is there's a lot quite a lot to memorize so it's all that and then all that and then all that and then all that so it's it's a tricky one to memorize <laughs> television was a baby crawling toward that death chamber that's like 20 pages long the bulk of this book is actually that one poem it's got mind breaths as well and mind breaths is the title poem of another collection of his poetry which I've read um, so I might read that one too we'll see and later on we get to like the one called sphincter for example we, he sort of almost became a bit of a dirty old man. I mean, he, he was never one for being censored or anything like that. So, but then he eventually just sort of just went all out writing these weird... Let me read Sphincter. Let me read Sphincter. So, for example, I hope my good old asshole holds out. 60 years it's been mostly okay. Though in Bolivia, a fissure operation survived the Alta Plano Hospital. A little blood, no polyps, occasionally a small hemorrhoid. Active, eager, receptive to phallus, coke bottle, candle, carrot, banana and fingers. Now AIDS makes it shy, but still eager to serve. Out with the dumps, in with the condomed orgasmic friend. Still rubbery muscular, unashamed, wide open, for joy but another 20 years who knows old folks got troubles everywhere necks prostates stomachs joints i hope the old hole stays young till death relax so i guess it's just because i think kind of in his in his youth i suppose especially as like a, a jew in like 1940s america or whatever it was kind of more frowned upon to be homosexual and so i think in his in his later years he kind of reveled in the fact that he could write about, like, having sex with other dudes and stuff, which is fine. But I, I, don't, I don't really like sex poems in general. <laughs> like, I, I prefer more of his stuff, like, his political stuff. Yeah, like, he has these lines in this poem called Love Comes. Like, there's, it's a long poem, but anyway. I sat on his thighs, looked in his eyes. I touched his hair, bare body there. Head to foot, big man root. I kissed his chest, came down from above. I took in his rod, he pushed and shoved. That felt best. My behind in his groin, his big boyish loin. Stuck all the way in, that's how we began. Both knees on the bed, his head to my head. He shoved in again, I loved him then. I pushed back deep, soon he wanted to sleep. He wanted to rest, my back to his chest. My rear went down, I rolled it around. He pushed to the bottom, now I've got him. He took control, made the bed roll. That reminds me, I read this book called Poetica by S.J. Warner, and it was basically the same. It's just, like, poetry that's erotica. Like, I don't know. I Like, I feel like Ginsberg had these really genius poems, and then he has these other ones. That, and, like, I also don't like rhyming poems as well. But I'm just like, why am I... Like, why did you write this when you could have been writing, like, stuff that is good? Like, I'm going to read a supermarket in California, so contrast this with with the weird erotica poetry. It's just a bit, a bit odd. What thoughts I have of you tonight, Walt Whitman, for I walk down the side streets under the trees with a headache, self-conscious looking at the full moon. In my hungry fatigue and shopping for images, I went into the neon fruit supermarket, dreaming of your enumerations. What peaches and what penumbras, whole families shopping at night, aisles full of husbands, wives in the avocados, babies in the tomatoes, and you, Garcia Lorca, what were you doing down by the watermelons? I saw you, Walt Whitman, childless, lonely old grubber, poking among the meats in the refrigerator and eyeing the grocery boys. I heard you asking questions of each, who killed the pork chops, what price bananas, are you my angel? I wandered in and out of the brilliant stacks of cans following you, and followed in my imagination by the store detective. We strode down the open corridors together in our solitary fancy, tasting artichokes, possessing every frozen delicacy and never passing the cashier. Where are we going, Walt Whitman? The doors close in an hour. Which way does your beard point tonight? I touch your book and dream of our odyssey in the supermarket and feel absurd. 
Will we walk all night through solitary streets? The trees add shade to shade, lights on in the houses. We'll both be lonely. Will we stroll dreaming of the lost America of love past blue automobiles and driveways, home to our silent cottage? Ah, dear father, grey beard, lonely old courage teacher, what America did you have when Sharon quit poling his ferry and you got out on a smoking bank and stood watching the boat disappear on the black waters of Leith? I think I got the words right there. I, I, I appreciate the Greek mythology references, I just don't know how to pronounce the words. I would say this is probably a pretty good introduction to Ginsberg as a poet if you've never read, read his work before. But that's not necessarily a good thing, like it's not the best of Ginsberg, it's just an accurate representation of his work I think, and Ginsberg had moments of genius and moments of madness really. In many ways, similar to the rest of the beat poets, they were all like that, like William Burroughs. Sometimes you just worry for his sanity, but other times you're like, wow, that was really good. Yeah, I don't know, I think if you haven't actually read Allen Ginsberg before, this is probably a good place to start just to get a feel for, for what his writing's like. And um, I mean, I'm quite a big Ginsberg fan, but I would probably, I, I'm going to give this one, I'm going to give it a 3.5 out of 5. I just don't think it had the best choice of, of poems within it, but it was still, it was still enjoyable because it's Ginsberg. So yeah. So anyway, let me know what you thought in the comments. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Subscribe for more bookish videos and I'll see you soon for another one. Low battery, gotta go. Bye. <laughs>
His lightish hair receded from a high forehead, and the prominent nose was matched by a thrusting chin. He wore baggy corduroy trousers and an immense pullover with a turtle neck. His companion was sallow, bespectacled, and squat. Here we go, that was it, Sharon. That was the other one. So they get to the electronics department, it says. The first installation to which we came appeared similar to the one we had built for the GPO some years ago. That is to say, a computer capable of speech, though its vocabulary was limited and the actual voice was far from perfect. McLean's box of tricks, however, had various accessories, and I went up to examine them closely. He's neat, don't you think, said McLean, rather like a proud father showing off his newborn infant. I call him Sharon One. We all have pet names for our inventions, and Hermes had seemed particularly appropriate for the winged messenger we had developed for the GPO. Sharon, if I remembered rightly, was the ferryman who conveyed the spirits of the dead across the sticks. I suppose this was McLean's own brand of humour. And actually, it did a pretty good job of dealing with technology, considering the age of the story. I think it worked out pretty well. This bit kind of confused me slightly, so it says here, For no reason at all, the half-forgotten lines of a Negro spiritual kept repeating themselves over and over in my mind. He has the whole world in his hands. He has the whole world in his hands. And, I don't know, I didn't know that was a Negro spiritual. We used to sing it in our white as fuck. <laughs> Catholic school that I went to, Catholic primary school. I hated that place. You used to, right, they used to make you sing the hymns in assembly, and if they caught you not singing, they would make you go and stand up in front of the whole school and sing it by yourself. Like, that kind of put me off singing for a long time. It was only when I was a teenager and got into music and playing guitar that I started singing again. So I don't want to go too much into what the story itself is actually about, but Again, we have this this mystery of life after death. It's almost a little bit Frankenstein-ish in that it's humans playing with those mechanisms that maybe are better off left to God. Although we all know how I feel about that. Yeah, I thought it was great. It was, for, for its length, it was the perfect length, really, for this story. I'm glad that it, you know, it wasn't dragged out to be too long and equally if it was any shorter I think a lot of the world building would have been lost. I thought it was a great little introduction to Maurier's work and actually I probably would recommend this if you're thinking about reading some of her stuff. This is a good one just to kind of wet, wet your whistle, check that you like her writing style. I mean it's not super thick so it's not like committing to Rebecca or something like that and if you do enjoy it then you can go ahead and read some more of her stuff. So it's rating time. I am going to give this I'm going to give it a 4.25, just to be awkward. So there we go, that's what I thought of The Breakthrough by Daphne du Maurier. So anyway, on that note, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this, or indeed if you've read any Daphne du Maurier. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to do a quick review of The Custard Heart by Dorothy Parker. So this is Penguin Mini Modern Classic number 4. So the blurb says, Wisecracking and heartbreaking, these tales of women on the edge by the legendary wit Dorothy Parker show the darkness beneath the surface of the jazz age. And so yeah, there are three short stories, yeah, three short stories here. It says, all stories taken from the collected Dorothy Parker, first published in 1944 as the portable Dorothy Parker. And it says here, she felt a cosy solidarity with the big company of the voluntary dead. All of these books in this series have this little quote at the beginning, so I've been enjoying kind of reading those quotes out to give you a feel for the books. What I will say with this one, my main problem was that they were basically the same story three times and actually it was just it was quite it was quite weird because it's like just all about drinking basically and I guess considering the time period she lived I mean 1893 to 1967 if if all of these were from the book that was published in 1944 as well it just seems a bit unusual that you would have a woman writer who's basically like it was on a par with Charles Bukowski, the amount these characters were drinking. So the three stories we have, we have The Custard Heart, which is obviously the titular story. We have Big Blonde, and we have You Were Perfectly Fine. And actually, Big Blonde is by far the longest of these. So I'm going to read a few of the bits that I found interesting. So from The Custard Heart here. I thought this was quite interesting. The way this is written, it's kind of a description of uh, courting 
in again in the jazz age i guess so which is what the 1920s 1930s maybe and actually this ties in really nicely with uh, what i've just been reading in this which is agatha christie's autobiography because these were kind of contemporaries i suppose and uh, i've been reading a lot about christie's courting days and that kind of thing and so it's interesting to get these different perspectives so anyway let me read this there was a pattern to the visits of the young men they would come in groups of three or four or six for a while, and then there would be one of them who would stay a little after the rest had gone, who presently would come a little earlier than the others. Then there would be days when Mrs. Lanier would cease to be at home to the other men, and that one young man would be alone with her in the lovely blue. And then Mrs. Lanier would no longer be at home to that one young man, and Gwenny would have to tell him and tell him over the telephone that Mrs. Lanier was out, that Mrs. Lanier was ill, that Mrs. Lanier could not be disturbed. The groups of young men would come again, that one young man would not be with them. But there would be, among them, a new young man, who presently would stay a little later and come a little earlier, who eventually would plead with Gwenny over the telephone. And actually, this character Gwenny, there's just some great little description over here, it says, Gwenny, her widowed mother had named her Gwendola, and then, as if realising that no other dream would ever come true, had died was little and compact and unnoticeable. So big blonde as well. I'm gonna read you the opening paragraph here because again, this is some, just some great characterization really. Hazel Morse was a large fair woman of the type that incites some men when they use the word blonde to click their tongues and wag their heads roguishly. She prided herself upon her small feet and suffered for her vanity, boxing them in snub-toed, high-heeled slippers of the shortest bearable size. The curious things about her were her hands, strange terminations to the flabby white arms splattered with pale tan spots, long, quivering hands with deep and convex nails. She should not have disfigured them with little jewels. We have some characterization here of a dude called Herbie. He was too nervous, he said, to sit and do nothing for an evening. He boasted, probably not in all truth, that he had never read a book in his life. I know a guy like that. I used to work with him. He was a filmmaker and he was like, I've never read a book. And I'm like, yeah, mate, I know, and I've never watched a film. We have this bit here about their relationship. So it says, uh, there had been a time when they had made up their quarrels, usually in bed. But that time's kind of over and it says now, each time he left the place in a rage, he threatened never to come back. She did not believe him, nor did she consider separation. Somewhere in her head or her heart was the lazy, nebulous hope that things would change and she and Herbie settled suddenly into soothing married life. Here were her home, her furniture, her husband, her station. She summoned no alternatives. She could no longer bustle and potter. She had no more vicarious tears. The hot drops she shed were for herself. She walked ceaselessly about the rooms, her thoughts running mechanically round and round Herbie. In those days began the hatred of being alone that she was never to overcome. You could be by yourself when things were alright, but when you were blue, you got the howling horrors. She commenced drinking alone, little short drinks all through the day. It was only with Herbie that alcohol made her nervous and quick in offence. Alone, it blurred sharp things for her. She lived in a haze of it. Her life took on a dreamlike quality. Nothing was astonishing. A Mrs. Martin moved into the flat across the hall. She was a great blonde woman of 40, a promising looks of what Mrs. Morse was to be. Their maid acquaintance quickly became inseparable. Mrs. Morse spent her days in the opposite apartment. They drank together to brace themselves after the drinks of the nights before. I don't know, I don't know too much about Dorothy Parker, but reading this book has made me want to learn more about her and her life, but it wouldn't surprise me to learn she was an alcoholic from the way that she writes about drinking, if that makes sense. Like Stephen King is the same, when he writes about drinking, you know that he used to be an alcoholic. Or that he is an alcoholic at the time, depending upon which book you read, you know. It says here, the, the coffee was all she had until she went out to dinner, but alcohol kept her fat. Prohibition she regarded only as a basis for jokes. You could always get all you wanted. She was never noticeably drunk and seldom nearly sober. It required a larger daily allowance to keep her misty minded too little and she was achingly melancholy. So Big Blonde is by far the longest of the stories in this. We also have a You Were Perfectly Fine. This entire story here is all about kind of that morning after regret. So he was like, oh, uh, tell me, was I very terrible last night? Which is where you get the title of the story, You Were Perfectly Fine. And um, we get this great quote here. Honestly, he said, I don't see how you could ever want to speak to me again after I made such a fool of myself last night. I think I'd better go join a monastery in Tibet, which is something that I often joke about as well. I've even wrote that line pretty much word for word in a poem of mine. Yeah, basically, he just gets himself into this situation with a lady that 
he he regrets very much. But also he has that very sort of stiff upper lip thing where he's like he's like his dialogue, his line of dialogue throughout this story is just oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. But at the same time, he kind of won't admit to the fact that he was just him being drunk and that he didn't mean what he said and did. All in all, I mean, all three of these stories are basically about drinking, which I wasn't expecting, to be honest. I did think it was a good little introduction to Dorothy Parker. I would have maybe liked to have seen a little bit more diversity in terms of the themes of the stories. But that said, when it's a small collection like this, it is kind of cool to have them all on a similar theme. I mean, it was interesting enough. I would say I would give this a... 3.75 out of 5. I can't quite give it a 4 just because it did drag in a few places, especially uh, Big Blonde. Favourite of my stories was that last one, You Were Perfectly Fine, and I think it's 4 pages or 5 pages long, so it was also the shortest, but overall, I mean, I thought this was a great little introduction to Dorothy Parker. I really enjoyed just her depictions of boozing, really. It's written by someone who kind of seems as though she knows about it. Maybe I'm totally wrong on that score, but I do want to now learn a bit more about her, so yeah positive experience really for my first one of her books and on that note thanks a lot for watching don't forget to let me know in the comments whether you've read this and or if you've ever read any Dorothy Parker let me know if she was a big drinker I guess because she seems that way hit that subscribe button if you would like to see more bookish videos hit that like button as well I almost forgot that one and I will see you soon for another bookish video thanks a lot bye bye Today, I am watching JD Estrada, there he is. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of three Japanese short stories by Akutagawa and others. So this is Penguin Mini Modern Classic number five. On the back here it says, three beguiling, strange, funny, and hair-raising tales of imprisonment, memory, and atrocity from early 20th century Japan. And so this one's interesting because it's three different authors and I'm going to butcher the pronunciation here. Okay, so the three authors are Nagai Kafu, born in 1879, Tokyo. Uno Koji, born 1891, Fukuoka. And Akutagawa Ryonosuke, born in 1892, Tokyo. And this is translated by Jay Rubin. And we have this little quote at the beginning here. How much fun are you getting out of life? I have kind of mixed feelings about this because the fiction here, it was good. And I guess it was probably a pretty good introduction to, you know, some classic or modern classic Japanese authors. But I don't think it's the best translated Japanese fiction that I've read. I, I think actually some of the more contemporary stuff... I think has been kind of braver and has taken more risks. So, for example, some of the stuff that I've been... This is admittedly stuff I've been sent through my book blog. But um, there was one about, um, li like, drug, drug addicts, basically, in Tokyo, for example. Which I did like the writing. I thought, presumably, it's a mixture of both the original Japanese writing and the translator, uh, Jay Rubin. He did a great job as well. It's very engaging. You know, if if you've never read any Japanese literature before, then I can understand why you would want to pick this up and use this as your way in. And, uh, yeah, there's some, some interesting stuff. So, for example, Behind the Prison here by Nagai Kaifu. This is uh, written in the form of a letter. It starts out, My dearest excellency, thank you for your letter. I've been back in Japan for nearly five months. I was in the West, as you know, but I was unable to find any fixed employment or to earn academic credentials during my time there. All I brought home with me was my collection of concert, opera and theatre programmes, as well as my photographs and nude paintings of female entertainers. I am a full 30 years old now, but far from being prepared to start my own family, I continue to while away my days in a single room on my father's estate, which is located behind the prison in Ichigaya. It has a rather imposing gate and a lush growth of tall trees. I'm sure you could find it easily just by asking for my father. I think a lot of the writing here as well is interesting because it kind of captures the culture and obviously I don't know a huge amount about Japanese culture so I don't know how these kind of societal attitudes might have changed since this was written but it's certainly interesting for like a snapshot of a time you know so let me read this uh, he's, he's just come back he's just walking across the crowded gangplank when welcome back brother and who should appear before me dressed in a university student uniform but my very own younger brother? I had naturally lost touch with my father, especially during the past two or three years, but, greatly worried, he had contacted the steamship company, learned which vessel I had boarded and sent my brother to meet the ship. 
Shamed by the extent of my father's efforts, I felt an instinctive urge to hide my face. At the same time, I was sick of parental affection. Why did my parents not simply turn their backs on a son who had proved himself so unfilial? And why did that son feel so threatened by his sense of gratitude towards his parents? Why, when he tried to force himself not to feel such gratitude, did he succeed only in filling himself with pain and dread? No, nothing in this world is as oppressive and debilitating as blood ties. Any other relationship, be it with friend, lover, wife, be it obligatory or constraining or difficult, is something one has consciously entered into at some point. Only one's ties with parents and siblings are formed at birth and are unbreakable. And even if one succeeds in severing such relationships, all one is left with is the unbearable agony of conscience. It is simply one's destiny. Your Excellency, I am certain you have seen sparrows that have built nests in the eaves of your home. No sooner do the young fly away from the nest than they escape forever from this fateful shadow. Nor do the parents make any attempt to bind their offspring's hearts with morality. I just think it's interesting. I mean, I guess it's a tad overwritten for my tastes, but... You can forgive that when you consider that it is translated fiction. Sometimes it's difficult to translate the, like, the nuances of the source material without overwriting it, if that makes sense. I like the characterization here of this character, of, of, this, of this woman. It says, uh, And yet she was very restrained in her tastes. As far back as her teenage years, she is said to have hated the colour red, and I never saw an under kimono of hers that could be described as gaudy, even when the family's clothing was spread out to dry at the height of summer. Perhaps a muted persimmon coloured grid pattern, or a pale blue usen print of plovers against white capped waves. We have a bit of description about the knights as well. All oh, the knights in Japan. No words can describe their darkness. Darker than death, darker than the grave, cold, lonely. Shall I call it a wall of darkness, an indestructible barrier that cannot be pierced by any blade of rage or despair, that cannot be scorched by any flame of rancour or frenzy? I sit beneath the only spot of light in the whole room, a single oil lamp, reading and re-reading the letters I exchanged with the people I knew in those days of joy, unable to read a letter to the end before having to press my face in tears against its pages. The cries of the insects fill the garden. Then we have Closet LLB by Uno Koji. And I like this, this is not the opening line, but it's not far off it, and it's about this character, and it just reminds me of myself when I was a student. So it says, As an undergraduate, Sansaku was, in fact, present on at least two-thirds of the days his college was open for classes, perhaps because the rules prohibited anything less, and his grades were on the high side. At university, however, he averaged 10 days a year, passing through the campus gate no more than 40 times in four years, as a result of which he graduated second from the bottom in his class. We have, I like this little bit of dialogue here as well. Am I, when I've been quite depressed at times, I've uh, kind of thought this last line of this little exchange. And you, he once asked a friend, are you enjoying life? The friend's only answer was a couple of non-committal grunts. Another friend answered the question with a straight out, not at all, to which Sansaku responded with his second pet phrase, Don't you want to die? I'd like to be killed without knowing it, the friends answered. And then finally we have General Kim by Akutagawa Ryonosuke. And I can't even remember what this one is about. Oh, this does have this fantastic line here though about... I guess about what makes a hero is Dawn had still not broken as General Kim, bearing Kai Vol Yang on his back, was running across a deserted plain. At the distant edge of the plain, the last traces of the moon were sinking behind a dark hill. At that moment, General Kim recalled that Kai Wal Yang was pregnant. The child of a Wa general was no different from a poisonous viper. If he did not kill it now, there was no telling what evil it would ferment. General Kim reached the same conclusion that Kiyomasa had arrived at 30 years earlier, he would have to kill the child. Heroes have always been monsters who crush sentimentalism underfoot. Without a moment's hesitation, General Kim killed Kai Wal Yang and ripped the child from her belly. In the fading moonlight, the child was no more than a shapeless, gory lump, but it shuddered and raised a cry like that of a full-grown human being. If only you had waited three months longer, I would have avenged my father's death. As the voice reverberated across the dusky open field like the bellowing of a water buffalo, the last traces of the moon disappeared behind the hill. Which is actually some really beautiful writing when you consider that that dude just killed a woman and then ripped her unborn baby out of her. Would you do that? If you knew that baby was going to grow up and be Hitler, would you, would you do that? I'd do it. You'd have to, even if it meant life in jail. You'd still be a hero if you killed Hitler's mom and ripped unborn baby Hitler out of her womb and then got sent to jail for murder. The problem is, is nobody would actually then know 
that you were a hero, they'd all think you were a monster because Hitler wouldn't get the chance to then grow up and become become the monster he was that made you then travel back in time to kill him. It would cause a paradox and everything would go tits up. Anyway, rating time. Actually going back through this, I realised that I enjoyed it more than I think I did. So I'm going to give this, I'm going to give it a 3.75 out of 5. It's not quite a 4 out of 5. But it was interesting and it was, uh, you know, pretty cool to get some more modern classical Japanese literature as opposed to contemporary Japanese literature, I suppose. So if you're into Japan stuff, check this out. Akutagawa and Others, three Japanese short stories. And on that note, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. If not, are you going to be grabbing a copy of it? Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Subscribe for more bookish content and I will see you soon for another video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.